Welcome to part 23 in this series on Prodigal Israel. In this episode, I want to examine the critical importance of the law that was given by Moses to the nation of Israel. Now, Paul asks a question in Romans about this. Uh, what advantage is there in being a Jew because the law was given to the Jews? And this is what he says. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Then he says, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So this is where the nation of Israel come in. God entrusted them with his oracles. And, and part of the oracles, part of the very foundation is the Torah or the law. Now, if you're anything like me and you've grown up um, being exposed to evangelical teaching or charismatic or Pentecostal teaching, then I'm sure you will have heard the phrase very often expressed, we're not under law, we're under grace. Thank God we're not under law, we're now under grace. And what is often meant by that is that the law is part of the Old Testament that was given to Israel. But thank God in the New Testament, we now are under grace. And so life is a lot easier under the dispensation of grace. God was very strict in the Old Testament. If you read through how he upheld the law very, very strictly, the penalties were huge. But now in the New Testament, it appears that God is more lenient because Jesus has died upon the cross, the price has been paid, and so we're under grace. And quite often you'll hear preachers say, all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus, repent of your sin, and then sit back and enjoy the ride, because by grace you are determined by God to be righteous, or he imputes the righteousness of Jesus to you, and there's nothing more to worry about, we're under grace. And along with that, the impression is given that God understands our weakness and thank God his grace covers it all. He's very merciful, he's loving and sometimes people even throw in the uh, erroneous idea that God's love is unconditional. So don't worry about your weaknesses. God understands and grace and mercy is abundant and so he will just pardon you. All you have to do is ask him to forgive. But when we examine exactly what the scripture says about the subject, we'll find that that understanding or that teaching is couldn't be further from the truth. We need to then look at how the law impacts our lives. In fact, I would go as far as saying that it's because of the law that we can be saved. Not by the law, but because of the law. Now that might sound uh, very strange or wrong to you, but listen carefully to what the scripture has to say and I'm sure you will then appreciate what I'm saying about the law. So what I want to examine in this episode is how critically important the law is to God, first of all. Then how does it impact the devil? How does the devil make use of the law? And then what are the implications for us as believers, Gentile believers and Jewish believers? So let's have a look at that and allow the word of God to bring some clarity and to and to put the emphasis of the importance of this subject upon our hearts. So let's start in the Garden of Eden, as I so often do, because everything seems to stem from that garden. And this is after the humans had sinned, and so God now addresses the serpent directly, and this is what he says. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, because you deceived the humans and got them to disobey my command, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So a curse is placed upon the serpent. And then I will put enmity between you and the woman. So the source of human life, the woman, out of whose womb all of humanity will come. There's enmity between the devil and humanity. And between your offspring, the offspring of the devil, and hers, the offspring of the woman. He, the offspring of the woman, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So that's right in the beginning of the Bible. God makes this prediction and he pronounces it upon the devil. So right throughout history, 
we now know and the devil knows that someone will eventually come, some human being who will crush his head and this serpent will be able to bite his heel and bruise his heel, but he will crush the head of Satan. So let's just keep this in the back of our mind as we further explore the whole question of the law of God. So concerning the law, we read in the New Testament, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, when you read that verse on its own, it almost seems to suggest that the Old Testament is something of the past and that the New Testament now is grace and truth through Jesus Christ. While that is true, it is not the full story. Because as we go on to read what Jesus had to say about the law, he says this, and we need to take very careful note of this. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says, I haven't come to take the law out of the picture, but I've come to fulfill the law. Now, obviously, we would need to understand what Jesus is saying about that. Now, I want to try and understand how the law fits in, the Old Testament law, the correlation between the Old Testament law and the gift of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is given as a free gift by grace. Now, here is this very well-known verse, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin, or the penalty of sin, or the consequence of sin is death. So how do we understand that? When Adam and Eve sinned, they were immediately alienated from the life of God. And so they had to be excommunicated from the Garden of Eden, from the presence of God, and that beautiful paradise into the planet that had been cursed, the ground had been cursed. So God had placed a curse upon the womb in the sense that the fruit of the womb, the woman would suffer and there would be pain in childbearing, but there'd also be pain for those who tilled the ground and tried to produce food. So there was a curse upon the production of food and the production of humans. And that was as a result of sin. But far worse than that, they were put out of the presence of God. And what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 is that we are dead even while we're living. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. So even without a law, just the very fact that Adam and Eve had disobeyed, they were now in a state of death. And they were self destructing. And Paul in Romans chapter 1 gives a very detailed and a very expert explanation of how the flesh degenerates, how human beings dehumanize themselves because they have sinned. So you don't even need the law to do that. Sin does that. But God introduced the law for a very, very important reason. Now, let me just try and illustrate that with a simple story. If there was a town where there were no traffic laws whatsoever and you could drive through that town and you decided to go through the town at 120 kilometers an hour, not stop at any stop street, go through all the red lights because you're in a big hurry, you wouldn't be breaking any law at all because there is no traffic law. But what you would be doing is endangering your life and the lives of others. So it is a wrong thing to do, even though there's no law. So you could actually be killed and you could kill someone else. But then if law is imposed in that town, traffic laws, and 60 kilometers an hour is the speed limit, and you have to stop at stop streets, have to stop at red lights, because that law has been imposed, then even if you got to a red light, and looked left and right and then no cars in sight and then drove through the red light, you would be transgressing the law, even though you are not endangering your life and not endangering the lives of others, you were breaking the law. And with the law comes the penalty for breaking the law. So 
when there is no law, no penalty can be imposed, but the moment there's a law, the penalty can be imposed. So let's look then what the scripture has to say about that. This, Paul tells us the sting of death is sin. So sin produces death. And the power of sin is the law. So the law has given teeth to sin because we not only are alienated from God by our behavior, but now we are alienated from God by transgressing the law, by breaking God's law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that the law came by Moses and the whole story of Mount Sinai as the children of Israel were gathered there. God came down upon that mountain and he gave the law to Moses, not only the Ten Commandments, but the all the other 603 laws that would make the nation of Israel completely distinct and stand out from the other nations. And they, according to what God said to them, would be an example to the other nations, a shining light, a light to the Gentiles. Now the question that must rise in our hearts is, did God know that in giving the law to the nation of Israel, they would not keep the law? Or was it some kind of experiment where he gave the law hoping that they would keep it, but that all failed, and so he had to come up with plan B where Jesus had to come and die upon the cross? Now the answer is quite clearly, definitely not. God gave the law to the nation of Israel knowing full well that they were going to break those laws. Now, the question then must arise in our hearts as to why would God do that? And the answer, I believe, is this, that Jesus could not come and represent us as a sinner. He couldn't come into the world and become a sinner to die upon the cross as a sinner. The only way he could bear our sin was to pay the penalty for sin, and the only way to impose a penalty was to introduce the law. So the law provides a framework for Jesus to pay the penalty on our behalf and set us free. It is absolute exquisite genius and wisdom on the part of God. So this is what we are then told as we look further at the scriptures, that Jesus had to become one of us. He had to have human blood and shed human blood upon the cross to pay the penalty for sin because sin now had become a transgression of the law. So this is what we are told. Since the children, that's human beings, the human family, have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. Now, that's a very important statement because here is where the devil was able to use the law against us. We're told that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, the children of God, and that day and night he makes accusation before God. Now, the basis of his accusation is that we have transgressed God's law. So he uses the law against us. Now, Jesus then, as we're told here in this Hebrew, this passage in Hebrews, Jesus became one of us so that he could die on our behalf and break the power of him who holds the power of death. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. So the law gives power to sin because we've transgressed the law and there's a penalty to that law. And that's what the devil used against us. That is the devil. And free those. So Jesus has freed those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abram's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way, like the human family. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest, in service to God, so a high priest, not only to make intercession, but to also sacrifice. Instead of sacrificing a lamb, he sacrificed himself. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is also able to help those who are being 
tempted. So the Apostle Paul is the one that unravels this rather complicated but very important truth about the law. And what he says is that it seems that when the law is imposed upon people who are already sinners, their position worsens. They actually look far worse. So he says, what shall we say then? So let's ask this question. That the law is sin. So let's ask, is the law sin? Is it detrimental to us? By no means, he says. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Because in our sin we deceive ourselves, and we justify ourselves. So we lose track of what is right and wrong. So he says, by imposing the law, here's the benefit. We know that we're actually sinners. So that's an important fact. Then he says, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, through the law, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. So in other words, my conscience was freed when I didn't have a law imposed upon me. But the moment the law was imposed upon me, suddenly I realized how sinful I really was because it highlighted my covetousness. Then he says, I was once alive apart from the law. Now that's not true in this sense that we still are dead in our trespasses and sins. In his conscience, there was no guilt. So he says, I was alive in that sense. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The conscience was awakened, guilt entered in, and in that sense I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me, for sin seizing opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So the this is what he's saying. The law imposed upon us as sinners has not helped us at all. Although it, the law itself is very good, because that's what he says. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. So the law is good, but the moment it's applied to sinners, we actually become worse. We are now guilty of transgressing the law. So then the other question that arises is, should we set the law aside and just depend upon the grace of God alone? Because that is what is often taught and suggested. This is what Paul says about that. He says, Is God the God of the Jews only? Because the law was given to them. Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too, since there is only one God, not two gods, not a Gentile God and a Jewish God, who will justify the circumcised, the Jews, by faith, and the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through the same faith, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So Paul's conclusion is that we don't set the law aside, but by embracing the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is given by grace through faith, we actually fulfill the law. We establish the law in our hearts. We don't set it aside. And just for a moment, going back to this original prediction where God said to the serpent that the seed of the woman, a human being, would crush the head of Satan. Now the question we've got to ask then is, did Jesus crush the head of Satan at the cross? So let's keep that question in mind as we look further at what the scripture has to say about this whole subject. If Satan was crushed and annihilated at the cross, then it is strange to read in the scriptures that he seems to be alive and well and giving us just as much trouble as he ever did before. Uh, Paul tells us the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now he's saying this long after the cross. Jesus has died, was buried, risen again, and ascended back to heaven. But he says the God of this world is still blinding the eyes and the minds of those that do not believe. Further to that, he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. 
So Paul is saying that the prince of the power of the air, the devil, is still very evident even after the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then we're told, Peter tells us, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So he's saying that the devil is still very active as a roaring lion, going about seeking whom he may devour. So let's have a closer look now at what was accomplished by the Lord Jesus on the cross and keep in mind the subject of the law because that plays a very vital role. So what we've already seen is that sin in itself is detrimental without the law because it alienates us from God and God is the source of life. So Adam and Eve were put out of the garden, alienated from God, out of fellowship with God, and had God not rescued mankind through the Lord Jesus Christ, they would have gone to eternal death, separated from God forever. So now let's look at sin. When the law is introduced, sin then becomes a transgression of the law, and that carries a penalty, the punishment of death. And that's where Jesus stepped in to bear that punishment on our behalf. Now let's consider a very vital passage that explains this so beautifully and clearly. Paul tells us, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Trespasses are breaking of the law. The uncircumcision of our flesh is the result of being born in sin, our sinful behavior. So he says, you being dead, spiritually dead, in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God is made alive together with Jesus. So he took our place, died on the cross, but having risen again, he's made us alive in him, having forgiven you all trespasses of the law. The penalty of the law has now been paid in full, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. The law was against us because we were sinners, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, because he has done that, he has removed the instrument that the devil has used against us to accuse us before God. The devil can no longer use the law because the penalty of the law has been paid. Although we've transgressed it, the price has been paid. And so having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. So by dying upon the cross, paying the price that was required by the law, he has removed the instrument that the devil uses against us, setting us free. So the devil can no longer use the law as a weapon against us. So it becomes quite clear from scripture that the devil has not yet been crushed. He is still alive and well in planet earth. But his end is coming. And the scripture tells us about that. It says in the book of Revelation, Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels, the dragon of course is the devil, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Now that's interesting because up until now, the devil has continued to hold his place, his position, his throne in heaven. Paul talks about the fact that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. So while he may not be at the throne of God in the third heaven, because he was the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God, he nevertheless has got a heavenly position, and he operates from that. Remember, even in the book of Job, when the sons of God, the angels, came together for the divine counsel, the devil was amongst them, and so he had to give an account to God. So he has been operating in this position right from the very beginning, but his end is coming. And so this is what we're told. There was war in heaven, and the devil and his angels were defeated, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, 
the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So there's coming a time when he'll be cast out of heaven and he will actually be now earthbound. And at that time, he will enter into a human being. So now we get right back to the beginning of the Bible where God said that his seed would bruise the heel of, of the Lord and the seed of the woman would crush him. So now he will enter into a human being just like Jesus came in a human form, so Satan likewise is going to come in a human form and that will be the Antichrist. And this is what Paul tells us about the Antichrist. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. There's the crushing, this human, the seed of the woman, crushing the seed of Satan. The Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. And then we see something further that we're told about the devil. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, just one angel, the ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So we see that God is using Satan all along the way. So he was not crushed at Calvary because God still has a use for Satan. And he didn't need Jesus to die upon the cross to overcome Satan. One angel can take the devil and bind him with a chain and put him in the bottomless pit. Then we're finally told, And the devil who deceived them, this is after the thousand years, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. That's the Antichrist and the false prophet. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So finally, the devil is cast into the lake of fire, into hell. Let me conclude this fairly complex subject, but a really wonderful truth by a quick summary. The law was introduced to impose the penalty of death upon the transgressors, but then Jesus took our place, paid the penalty for those who are prepared to accept that by faith. The devil then was not crushed at Calvary, but he was disarmed by removing the law that he was using against us to condemn us. Now, all he has in his arsenal is to try to tempt us and use the weakness of our flesh to draw us away and then try to heap us with condemnation and guilt. But God has set us free from that. And this is the wonderful verse then that takes on a new meaning as we take all of these things into account. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By faith, by water baptism, we've identified with the Lord Jesus. We're in Christ Jesus. So now there is no condemnation because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law is good, but it became a law of death to us because we were sinners. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful humanity to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in human flesh by virtue of the law, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. That's wonderful. Who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. So there is the condition, but then God offers us His grace, His Spirit, and mercy to help us in our time of need, so that we can live and, and obey the law from the heart, having written it upon our hearts and upon our minds, to walk in a way that is pleasing to Him. Amen. God bless you.